Real slowly, he gets up out of his chair, walks over to Cat in the Hat, and he beat this guy into a coma. There was blood all over the floor. Everybody scatters. Let's talk about some of the gangs that were in the prison. I'm sure you saw quite a lot of different gangs. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what gangs may have held the most power? Uh, some violent encounters you possibly saw with the gangs there? The most important and powerful gang was called uh, Pisces. And it's a uniquely prison gang. So Pisces is literally every Hispanic in the prison. You could be a member of the Mexican Mafia, the Latin Kings, the Borachos, the Norteños, the MS-13. You're still a member of Pisces. Just because you're Hispanic. Just because you're Hispanic. And they're really serious about this, where they have mandatory workouts every day. Every day you have to lift weights. Every day you have to do calisthenics. And every single Hispanic has to play soccer. And that's so in the event of a race riot. They're ready. They're, they're ready. And they're trained. And they are. Um, so within the Pisces, you have these different um, subgroups, these different gangs. We had Bloods and Crips, mostly Bloods, but we had some Crips too. And then their two shot collars had an overall black shot collar who kept the peace. And then among the whites, we had the uh, Aryan Brotherhood. We had the Odinists that, that prayed to the, the Norse god uh, Odin. And then the Italians. Now the Italians were by far the smallest group, but by far the most highly respected. There, Why was that? You know, I, I'm not exactly sure. I will say one of the things I learned very early on about the Italians is that they're the most honorable people in the, in the prison. They don't steal from anybody. They don't go behind anybody's back. What you see is what you get. They're, they're true to their word and they're very honorable people. I don't know anything about the Italians. I've never had any experience with them being locked up uh, because they are, for the most part, gonna be in the federal, federal system. system. But my assumption of what the Italians would be like in there would be relatively older, older guys. Is that what it is? There was almost no middle. There was the older guys. We had the boss of the Gambino family. We had the wow. underboss of the Bonanno family. We had the boss of the De Calvicante family. I mean, these are serious, high level. We had two captains from the uh, Bruno Testa family in Philadelphia. These are high level guys. Then there's nobody in the middle. And then you have a whole bunch of low level guys. So altogether, there were only probably a dozen and a half genuine Italians in, in prison, uh, but they commanded great respect. Let's talk about some yeah. violent encounters you saw involving gang activity. There, there was one major event uh, about six weeks before I got there. Uh, it, was a, uh, it was a black Hispanic, really it was, it was a riot to the point where they went into lockdown for several weeks. Uh, it, was, it was a couple of black guys who had somehow disrespected the Hispanics. The Hispanics waited for days until these guys were out on the yard. And then they got bocce balls to beat them, to bash their heads in with bocce wow. balls. You know what hard, dense wood bocce balls yeah. are made out of. Baseball bats. Um, it got so bad that uh, they had to land a helicopter on the yard to life light a couple of these guys to Pittsburgh. So there was nothing like that once I got there. It was still tense when I arrived. And to make matters worse, uh, a guard in a nearby prison had been murdered the day before I arrived. And so when I arrived uh, at Loretta, we were on lockdown for the first week. So I didn't see the major race riots. What I saw was mostly fights about what to watch on TV. And then there was one bloody fight between an Aryan and a rat. And I was shocked when the rat took this guy down. And this was a great, big, strong Aryan who's working out constantly and running the track. And I guess this, this rat just figured he had nothing to lose. And, uh, and he fought as if his life truly depended on it. There was one incident in my TV room uh, in Central Unit, which I instigated. And I was happy to do it. There, there were two prisoners. I mentioned to you briefly the cat in the hat a few minutes ago. This, this was a bad guy. This was a guy who was in on a murder for hire. And what happened in his case was that he owed the, the mafia $100,000 in gambling debts. He couldn't pay it. So what he did, because he's a moron, is he took out a $100,000 life insurance policy on his uh, business partner and, and best friend. 
and hired a hitman. The hitman flew up from New Orleans. The guy picked him up, the cat in the hat picked him up at the airport, gave him the gun, drove him to the partner's house. The guy goes into the house, kills the partner. Cat in the hat takes him back to, to Pittsburgh airport, keeps the gun. Uh, and then he calls the insurance company. He doesn't even call cops. He calls the insurance company and says, oh, my partner is dead. Um, so I need to collect on this $100,000 life insurance policy. Two hours later, he's under arrest. So they arrest the hitman as well. Well, much to everybody's surprise, the hitman doesn't say a word, but Cat in the Hat just rats out the hitman and, and confesses to the whole thing. So the deal was Cat in the Hat would get 20. If he testified against the hitman, they were seeking the death penalty against the hitman. He agreed, he rats the guy out. But in the course of the trial, the hitman dies of a heart attack in jail. Well, the feds had to respect the deal they made with Cat in the Hat. They gave him his 20. He had done 10. When he finished his 10, he transferred to my prison for the next 10. I didn't like this guy from the get-go. I didn't like that he was a rat. I didn't like his crime. And he wanted to move into my cell because we had a good cell. I said, absolutely not. I don't like you. I don't like what you did and I don't like your crime and your response to it. So he kind of had it out for me. Well, there was another guy uh, we called Truck, who was a long distance truck driver in the 1970s. To make a long story short, he had committed a series of sexual assaults along his truck route. And um, several of the women that he assaulted testified against him. He got 20 years in a state penitentiary in Colorado. The issue with him was though, that along that same truck route, at the same time, women were being murdered. And so the cops thought it was him, but these were the days before DNA testing. And so they, they couldn't get him on, on those charges, but they got him on, on these sexual assaults. And so he did 20. Now the state of Colorado had wanted him to spend the rest of his natural life in prison. They were upset that he only got the 20. And so they kept pushing him and nudging him and, and trying to force his hand when it came to his parole. They would call him in the middle of the night. They would go to his house in the middle of the night. And finally, he shoved his parole officer. Well, that's an assault and it's a parole violation. And so the parole officer called the cops to come and search the house and they found guns. And so they got him on, fell in with a gun. It's a mandatory minimum of eight. He got another 20. So although they didn't get him on the crime they thought he committed, he ended up with 40 years in prison. Well, this guy was very, very violent. He would beat up his roommates all the time. And I mean like seriously beat them up if they were talking too loudly, if they put the light on while he was taking a nap, they'd get a beat down. This guy, for whatever reason, actively sought my approval. I kept him at arm's length, but he was constantly trying to ingratiate himself with me. Well, I'm sitting next to him in the TV room one day and Cat in the Hat doesn't see that I'm sitting like four feet away. And I had been called to the lieutenant's office earlier in the day to sign a, a form saying that I was agreeing to an interview with NPR. They had called that day. And uh, so Cat in the Hat had heard that I was called to the lieutenant's office. And he says to the guy next to him, did you hear they called Kiriaku to the lieutenant's office? That guy's a rat. And Truck is sitting next to me, as I said. He leans over and he says, did you hear that? That guy called you a rat. And I thought, this is your chance. This is my chance. And I said to him, a couple hours ago, he called you a child molester. Truck turns and looks at me. He ain't like that at all. He, did, he doesn't say a word. He didn't like it one bit, right? He looks at me. Real slowly, he gets up out of his chair, walks over to Cat in the Hat, and he beat this guy into a coma. There was blood all over the floor. Everybody scatters, right? They all run back to their rooms because they don't want to be implicated in this. So what happened is the cops took both Truck and Cat in the Hat to solitary. Cat in the Hat for his own safety and for him to recover down in there. He was beaten. He was beaten senseless. I had never seen a beating like that in real life. And Truck, got another assault charge, they added two years to his sentence, and they sent him to a medium security prison. One major difference between the federal and state system, you being in federal prison, I was in state. When I go to prison, I'm not leaving the state of Virginia. I'm right. staying right here. Right. The federal system though, they can send you to California, yes. Alaska. And they do that, and it's called diesel therapy. 
I was threatened with diesel therapy when I started writing this blog that I was calling Letters from Loretto. I had crazy success with this blog. My first one got a million hits because it was picked up by the Huffington Post. Oh, wow. And once the Huffington Post got it, it went crazy. It was on all the major news broadcasts. It was in the newspapers the day after that. By the end of the week, it was in the magazines. I was in The Economist and GQ and Playboy and The Atlantic Monthly. It was crazy. And the, the prison administration didn't like this kind of attention. So they started talking about diesel therapy. I never heard of diesel therapy. I didn't know what that meant. But there was one friendly administrator who came up to me and warned me. They're talking about putting you in diesel therapy. I said, what is that? And what it is, is as you say, Joe, the, the US prison system is national. It's nationwide. They don't have to put you anywhere near your home or your family. They can put you anywhere they want. So what they do is they put you on a bus, which is powered by diesel, and they send you to USP Canaan, Pennsylvania, for example. That's a transportation hub. Maybe you're there for a week, maybe you're there for a month, then they send you to Harrisburg, where you catch a Conair flight to Atlanta, USP Atlanta. Maybe you're in Atlanta for a week or two or four. And then they send you to Oklahoma City, which is the national transportation hub. And then maybe to Yankton, South Dakota, and maybe Lompoc, California after that, or Tallahassee, Florida. And they keep you in transit because if you're a federal prisoner in transit, you're not allowed to have access to a phone, to the mail, or to the email system. So there's no way your family would even know what time zone you're in. You're constantly in transit, and they can do that for up to a year. Well, that's what they threatened me with. So I immediately wrote a blog. I smuggled it out. It was published again on the Huffington Post, went crazy again, viral uh, post. This was a blog post about the diesel therapy. About the diesel therapy. And I, and I said, they're threatening me with diesel therapy because I'm practicing my constitutional right to freedom of speech. So what happened was people like Yoko Ono tweeted, hands off John Kiriakou. John Kuzak called my wife to ask what he could do to be helpful. And he tweeted, there were 1,600 phone calls to the director of the Bureau of Prisons saying, you better leave that guy alone. And they backed off. That is insanity. It was crazy. And then I learned a great piece of intelligence. It just so happened that the following weekend, my cousin came to visit me from Pittsburgh. And when he was out in the lobby waiting to come in, he heard two cops talking about me. One of them said, who's that guy coming to visit? And the other cop said, uh, Kiriakou. Oh, that guy that's writing those blogs? How come that guy's not in solitary? And the first cop says, I asked the warden that. And the warden said, we can't put him in solitary because he hasn't used any of our names. So my cousin told me this. And I said, this is a great piece of intelligence. I realized at that moment, I could write anything I wanted. I could say anything I wanted. And so long as I didn't use their names, they couldn't touch me. So all of the blog posts are in the book. And again, I will be including links to John Kariaku's books down in the descriptions as well. John Kariaku's case was actually pretty high profile, which brought in a lot of attention from not only media sources, but also celebrities as well, as he was just mentioning with uh, Yoko Ono. Yeah, Yoko Ono was very good to me, John Cusack, Daniel Ellsberg. I got $5,000 from Roseanne Barr, wow. uh, the comedian. She's, I like Roseanne. I, I like I, Roseanne. <laughs> she's she's uh, number one on my list. Uh, but uh, Susan Sarandon, the Academy Award winning actress. Um, I mean, I, I've, I've lost count the number of people who... Um, who helped me out, who were supportive, who, who tweeted about my case to their millions of followers, who sent money from my, my defense fund. It was really amazing. That is insanity. Mm. But one thing that I want to mention as well with what you were writing from prison and what I was writing as well, that was something that I also did myself was not mention anyone's name. Right. So what I would actually do when I would be telling a story about some of the crazy stuff that I was experiencing, I would make up little nicknames for either the prison staff or the actual right. prisoners that I was in there with. You know, that way I couldn't really be <laughs> held too accountable for putting someone on, on uh, you know, full right. display. I did the same thing. Did you actually have nicknames for guards or other prisoners? Oh, yeah. Horseface, Big Dummy, <laughs> Spawn of Horseface. Yeah. What do you think the worst thing about prison was? 